Hey. Um, so there are uh, 12 of us who have all volunteers. Nobody in the Hunt Saboteurs Association is paid for any of the work they do. Most of us give up two or three hours every single day of our own time to make sure the Hunt Saboteurs Association runs smoothly. Um, now, I've been a Hunt Sab for 35 years. I did a lot of other things as well. Um, Anti-vivisection protests, anti-nuclear, anti-racist stuff. Um, and we've seen a lot of changes in the hunt sabotage over that time. In particular, in 2005, certain types of hunting were made illegal in the United Kingdom. And the traditional British fox hunt, seeing the picture behind you here, all these um, extremely wealthy people in their red coats, their supporters in their black jackets, a pack of 50 um, hunting hounds. What these guys want to do is they want to get into the woods and they want to make a fox start to run for its life. And those 50 hunting hounds are going to chase that fox across open fields. And what these guys in the red jacket want to see is that fox being torn to pieces by those 50 hunting hounds. I'd, I've been around these guys for 35 years. If I live to be 100, I will never understand why it is they want to do what they want to do. Um, because it is actually horrific. If you're close to a, a fox when it dies or other hunted animal, it screams, it's fighting for its life. All foxes, they're members of the dog family, um, they're outnumbered 50 to 1, and they know they're going to lose. And like any dog, when it knows it's losing a fight, what it does, it lies on its back in surrender. The first bite is a waste of the belly. So whatever the hunters say about the fox dies quickly from a, a bite to the back of the neck. It's absolute rubbish. They die by having their guts ripped out. It is truly awful, and they scream. Uh, it's, it's one of the most, the most harrowing things you can ever see. But once hunting became made illegal, um, this obviously dented the hunters a great deal. They can no longer enjoy that chase unless, of course, no one's watching them. And as we'll come back to later, the police are not enforcing this law. The police do not care about the Hunting Act in Britain. So the only way these guys get stopped is when the hunt tab shows up. Now, that little technical glitch earlier was audio problems. I hope this is going to work. This is Sabs arriving on a hunt. They like this little bit of woodland. They always hunt this particular bit of woodland. But look what happens as soon as they know we're here. They don't want us following them into that wood. They've got something in there they don't want us to find. Funny enough, I went for a very nice long walk around that wood the other day. Hmm, interesting. The guy that you just saw go past you there used to be one of their top um, violent thugs. Um, he got promoted. They gave him a red coat for being violent against hunt saboteurs. Um, he's gone now. I wonder why. Now, if the video cameras aren't sufficient to stop them, there's lots of other things that we use. Um, the key thing is the hunt saboteurs want to take the control of that pack of hunting hounds away from the huntsman. Right? So um, as you'll hear in the clip that's coming up, in fact, I'll show you this little device. This is a gizmo. You can see the word up on the screen. This is what a gizmo is. Um, it's a little box. And when hunting hounds find a fox, they start making the strangest of noises. You're about to hear it a couple of ways. So that's a hunting hound who thinks he's found a fox. You play that little device and you run like the wind. Watch what happens next. Absolutely. Get it going, get it going, run. We are in control of the pack. And you can hear me on the radio there telling the other Sabs that we've got control of the pack. So we've actually taken that entire pack of hunting hounds away from the huntsman. Um, of course, all the time that they're under our control, 
the huntsman hasn't got them, where well, he can't possibly be um, hunting with them, can he? Right. Needless to say, they're not too happy about that idea. So they've got to then try to get control of their pack back. We're leading them on a merry dance through the woods here. Heading south. I'm sorry, all sad videos are like the Blair Witch Project because you're always running. <laughs> Here's the red coat. He realises we've just taken his hounds away from him. He's not a happy man. You can also hear, hear the voice calls like this. Glad I didn't do that down the mic, aren't you? This is, uh, this is something a huntsman would do to make the hounds more excited, make them want to run. The field approaching, watch the field approaching. Right. The reference to the field there is all the other riders. So it's the big group of riders, they're coming around to try to head off the hounds that are running in the direction the huntsman doesn't want them to go. Yeah, we just got them again. I think you'd like them back. You can see the red-coated huntsman now trying to get round in front of the running hounds and try to get in the control of them back again. Now, this little episode lasted about 45 minutes. So for 45 minutes, the huntsman didn't have his hounds under control, and all that time, he can't possibly be hunting anything. <laughs> they're trying to, right, this is, uh, this, we come back to this later. The hunters try to claim that they're actually hunting within the law because they're laying a false scent trail and the hounds are only following the false scent trail and not actually chasing foxes. But of course, this is just a lie that they use every time they get caught hunting. They go, oh, we're, we're laying trails, we're laying trails, you're stopping, we're doing something legal. No, you're not. We've seen you. We try to be law abiding and you lot. We try to be law abiding and you lot. Oh, you lot. And of course, it's not just the wild animals that suffer, right? I think it's going to come up in this clip now. The hunts in the UK alone kill 11,000 hunting dogs every year. Most of them are under a year old. So I don't care whether they're laying trails or not, actually. If they're going to kill 11,000 of their own hounds, I'm going to carry on sabbing them. The day that we stop sabbing is the day the last red coat is on a bonfire somewhere. Right, did you know that hunts around this country kill 11,000 hunting hounds every single year? We will keep sabbing you until you give up and go away. When the last red coat is hung up or burnt, we will stop. 11,000 hunting hounds, most of them at less than a year old. Your evil is unspeakable. You should be thoroughly ashamed. Because they don't like it when you're telling the children that they're taking out hunting, that they're killing 11,000 dogs a year. We didn't find that. That was a mission by one of your own people. Come on, girls. Come on, girls. Don't listen to this nasty auntie telling you that we kill our own dogs. Be honest. How many hundreds of horses die at the hands of the hunt every year? And that's another issue, the number of horses they kill. We don't even have figures on it, but we know that it happens all the time. We see it. I think the most horrific one I ever saw, one of the hunters jumped out of a field over a hedge onto a road and the horse's front legs went out. Hounds are gathered and heading south. And it died of a heart attack on the roadside. And that's happening all the time and no one's even monitoring. What we have been told by them is that most of the horses don't die on the day. So they get injured, they get taken off, they see if they recover, and then if they don't recover, dog food or Tesco's burgers. In one pack, 50. Right, so if... The gizmos and the voice calls don't work. Lots of other techniques. This is a can of spray. It's got an essential oil called citronella in it. Hunting hounds hunt by scent. So um, if, they actually, if a fox breaks from cover and goes past you, you have to really, really hold your nerve. You have to be very, very still, very quiet. Keep the group really 
tight and compact and as low as possible. Wait for the fox to go by, and then you spray the citronella spray on the ground where the foxes run. The hounds then can't smell where the fox has gone. They can't follow it. Um, I didn't bring the whip with me today. This is one of our other tools. Those hounds will have been trained to a whip. They'll have been beaten since they were puppies. They will know the noise of a whip. Right? And a hound hears a whip, and it's saying, stop doing what you're doing. You're doing something naughty. Hunt stabs make these very simple homemade little whips out of a bit of climbing rope and a bit of broom handle. You just crack it, not anywhere near the hounds, but just the noise is enough. If you haven't got that, you just clap your hands. It's the same kind of sound. And the hounds think, I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing here. Well, am I not meant to be chasing this fox? And they kind of slow and they look and the heads come up. And then you get the hunting horn going, um, the gizmo on or whatever. I love this little toy. I'm not actually particularly good at blowing this, I'll be honest. So the huntsman will be using that device to try to tell the hounds to run faster or to come back to him or a whole other heap of instructions he gives. The most common one the hunt sabs use is the one I've just done there, which actually just tells, you, tells the hounds to come to you. So if you can get that bit of confusion amongst them and not sure what they're meant to be doing, you're just going to use that to call them over to you. Again, you've got the control the huntsman hasn't, and they're not hunting. Oh, who's that in the photo? Right, hare and mink hunts, um, again, illegal since 2005. Very, very hard to find. They're really elusive. Unlike a fox hunt where you might have 100 riders, all of whom have got horse boxes, you find 100 horse boxes in the field on a Saturday in British countryside, you know you've got a fox hunt going on. The hare and the mink, you might only have a dozen vehicles, so they're really difficult to track down. But they can't make this pretense of trail laying there's no way you could be using this type of hunting dog and laying a trail for it. So the moment you catch up with them, that's it. They have just got to stop because they've got no excuses. This is a great one. We weren't even out sabotaging. We had some new sabs in the group. We thought we'd teach them how to read maps. So we went out and went into the countryside to do a map reading exercise. And one of the other experienced sabs went, what's going on over there? There's a lot of vehicles. There's a lot of dogs. There was a mink hunt going on. <laughs> so we crossed the field and there they were. They weren't very pleased to see us. The funny thing is they're all about 70 years old and I was actually on the phone to the police saying there's an illegal mink hunt going on when this old guy in the white shirt actually hit me whilst I was talking to the police on the phone. It's a rare one. The police actually came that time. Didn't do much when they got there, but they did at least arrive. Um, shooting's a whole different ball game. Right? Shooting is still legal. Um, if you're sabotaging a shoot, you're probably trespassing, so really you are breaking the law when you're doing it. Um, but we're really lucky in the UK. If you stand in front of a man with a gun, by law, he has got to open that gun and remove the bullets. If he doesn't, he's the one breaking the law. Right? Now, if we get arrested for a bit of aggravated trespass, the chance of nothing much is going to happen. But if he gets arrested for a Section 4 offence of causing alarm, harassment and distress by not removing the bullets, he's losing his gun licence and he can't shoot anymore. So he knows he's got to open that gun. Sometimes they have the men who are driving the animals towards them. They can get quite violent with you, but the shooters themselves never do because they know what the consequences would be. And one of our really great, great success stories, I'm so pleased with this, the photograph on the left there are men who are culling seals in the, in the waters around the east coast of Scotland. Well, at least they were. We went up there and we were going to do what sabs do. We were just going to get between them and the seals and stand in the way and dare them to shoot us. When we got there, we found they changed where their tactics were. They can only shoot the seals near to where their fishing nets were. They'd moved them from where they were the year before, which were close to the little coastal fishing villages of Scotland. And they'd hidden them on very, very inaccessible bits of coastline so people couldn't see what they were up to. So having found this out, we spent four days as an undercover team, just two of us, finding all their fishing nets. On the evening of day two, we got a real break. Um, these two idiots were only too willing to talk to the very pretty young lady who was working with me. So we just went down to the harbour as they came back and she chatted to them. And after 20 minutes, they told us everything we needed to know. <laughs> Based on that information for the next two days, we located every single one of their nets, um, mapped them up and handed them over to our good friend Sea Shepherd, who arrived with their little orange inflatable boats and simply parked their boats in between the seal shooters and their nets. And they got a bit upset and hit one of the Sea Shepherd guys. And then the next day, 11 hunt sabs arrived and suddenly the shooters didn't want to be violent anymore. I can't think why. Um, 
over a three-year campaign, we have closed them down. Right? They are no longer... <laughs> they're no longer allowed to do the coastal netting. What they're doing is putting these nets near the river mouths where the salmon were coming to spawn. They have done so much damage to the salmon population, there are no salmon left. So the Scottish government has banned them from three, for three years from coastal netting. That has saved the lives of millions and millions and millions of salmon. But without the nets in the water, they're also not allowed to shoot seals. So hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of seals on the, west, on the east coast of Scotland have been saved this year already. We've seen the figures. One seal has died on the east coast compared to hundreds in every previous year. And that's because these guys have been shut down. Right. <laughs> We're after the fish farms on the west coast next. On your right there, the wounded badger patrols. Um, the British government, in the most incredible act of stupidity and environmental vandalism I have ever heard of, decided to wipe out the badgers in certain areas of the British countryside for the heinous crime of giving tuberculosis to cattle, which they don't do anyway. Uh, but despite all of the scientific evidence that the badgers don't cause the TB in cows, the government has gone ahead, and as we speak, there are hundreds and hundreds of hunt sabs out in the countryside in the now 12 coal zones uh, around the southwest of the United Kingdom. Again, getting in the way of the shooters, releasing badgers from the traps, uh, just everything and anything that anyone can do to stop the badger cull from happening, and costing the government an absolute fortune. Now, needless to say, not everybody loves hunt sabs. Can't think why. Um, some of the hunters get really quite aggressive. Um, that's a very historic photograph on the right. That must date from the 70s. I know the sab on the left there. He's still sabbing, amazingly. He's greyer than I am as well. Now, um, <laughs> terrier men. The official job of terrier men is they have the terrier dogs, usually Jack Russell terriers. If a fox goes underground, they put the Jack Russell into the fox hole. The fox and the dog fight with each other underground. The dog has a radio collar. When that radio signal is not moving, they know that the fox and the dog are face to face with each other fighting. They dig down, they dig out the fox and they kill it. But they are also one of the main sources of violence against hunt saboteurs because they're basically nasty little thugs. And their employees like making use of that. Let's see if I can get this one going. Right, this is my well, my group's Land Rover arriving. Um, we know that the hunt is just over to the right of us, and we know they're about to attack. There's a this is very high ground to the right, and we know that the foot sabs are on the top of this ground, and we know all the terrier men are in this farm, and we can see them gearing up for an attack. We know them so well. We know when they're going to start trouble. So I'm actually on the phone to the police saying that our foot team's about to get attacked when this happens. I got away lightly. I just got that stick around the back of the head. This footage is from taken from another Sab Land Rover. You can hear the driver screaming in the background. He couldn't get the vehicle started in time. They got him and beat him with a rock. More terrier men. Um, the Countryside Alliance, the group that represents the hunters, have got this big campaign about hunt saboteurs are masked up, they must be criminals. Um, these are terrier men, these are their people. You might notice that they've got their faces covered. Um, the guy on the left, extremely well known, very, very violent. Um, what happened in the immediate aftermath of this was absolutely awful. The hounds were in cry and going off to the left, and the sabs were coming down a steep bank to try to get into this field. Um, the huntsmen themselves came riding down the bank, got off their horses and attacked the sabs. And the guy in the motorcycle crash helmet, you see just your left there, headbutted one of the sabs, causing serious injuries over his eye. But that wasn't the worst of it. One of the huntsmen used his riding crop, used the handle of it, and he smashed one of the sabs in the forehead. Um, the last I heard, he was still awaiting the surgery to remove the bit of his skull from the front of his brain. So that was really, you know, that was absolutely terrifying. Uh, funny enough, the big guy, I was just blocking him. 
and I know his name. This is when you when you're sad. When one of the things that you do to keep yourself safe, if you know the name of the person you're facing, you keep saying their name and keep saying their name, keep saying their name. They're very unlikely to attack you because they know you can ID them. So all day long, I was just nagging at this guy, and luckily he actually stayed out of the fight when it happened. But it wasn't enough to save the other two. It's a great shame. Um, and sometimes it's the people, the, the supporters of the hunt, they're not actually out hunting themselves. This is a very, very, very angry land landowner. He was very annoyed that we'd driven our Land Rover onto his farm. That angry. And he's not satisfied with that. This vehicle weighs about 15 tonnes. You can see he drives it within a few metres of the cameraman and straight into the Land Rover for the second time. And he still wasn't satisfied. There's a plough on the back of the tractor. The real tragedy of that is he actually had us blocked in for about an hour and a half and the rest of the Sabs on board the vehicle that day had actually left the vehicle behind to try to get back to the hunt. We got there just too late and the hunter just killed a fox. In fact, he died in her arms as we tried to get it to a vet, which is most distressing. And if you thought that one was bad, sometimes it's the hunters themselves that cause the problems. You may have seen this video clip, it's quite well known one. Keep an eye on the two people on the right of your shot here. been run down by a horse. But she's on the ground, um, unconscious. On the, Get her out she's there. She's on the ground. She's on the ground, not moving. What are the kids? 464869. He's doing about 25 kilometres an hour as he hits her. He claimed it was an accident. Oh yeah, they'll do that. Oh yeah, they dropped the case against him. <laughs> oh my god! Give me the phone! Give me the phone! Now fortunately, as a result of the enormous amount of pressure that was put on the police, um, regarding this, as you can see there, people were told to get in contact with them. They did actually then reopen the case. It's been adjourned time after time after time, but is actually due in court next week. So it would be fascinating to see what the actual outcome of that is. And SABs take damage. This is the one I was saying where the guy on the bottom left there, this is where the guy with the motorcycle crash helmet headbutted him. Um, the one in the middle there, um, on the day that our Belgian colleagues came out to join us to Sabah Hunt in England, was one of those days where the hunt turned extremely violent. It was a racially motivated assault. They heard the Belgians speaking in French and attacked them because English is the language here. 
Um, in the ensuing fracas, um, one of the hunters produced a knife and slashed the thumb of one of the hunt saboteurs wide open. Um, the police dropped the charges against him, would you believe? All right, top left there, good old friend of mine. It was a very violent day in 97. The lady in the middle at the top there, they actually pushed her off a bridge and she hit her head on the concrete base of the bridge as she fell. I was trying to do the first aid on her and there were horses were going over the top of me. I was trying to talk to the ambulance control. I said, like, we've got a lady here with a head injury. They said, Whatever you do, don't move her. It's like, I'm moving her because she'll die if she stays where, he, where she is. Um, they respect some people. And sadly, of course, um, Two hunt have died down the years. It's Mike Hill on the left and Tom Warby on the right. They were both crushed to death by hunt vehicles. Um, both young men who lost their lives doing the thing that they believed in so much. And I've been on the receiving end a few times myself. The two features on the left-hand side there, the gang at the bottom and the owners, the Yetney Boys. They're a group that are sent out to specifically start fights with hunt saboteurs. They've all got a bit old now, actually. I bumped into the big guy recently and he was a shadow of his former self. That's me on the, amb on the stretcher being taken to the ambulance. Um, we tried to get away. The police set up a roadblock so we couldn't escape. Um, so we got out of the vans. We were going to run across the fields. And I suddenly sort of started to think, I don't feel very well here. So I sat down and then I fell over. And then I realized I was lying in a pool of blood and they called an ambulance for me. The police would not let the ambulance come through the police roadblock. So they actually had to stretch me over 300 meters from where I'd actually fallen up to the ambulance because the police wouldn't let the ambulance come to me. Um, the other two incidents both happened on the, an area of the, the South Downs, which is about 60 kilometers south of London. Um, the bottom one there, was a, it was an absolute trap. The huntsman was riding along, blowing his hunting horn to make the hunt, the, the hunt sabs think that the hunter was up on the top of the, the hills. They weren't there, the hounds weren't there. It was a trap, they'd drawn us in. Um, when they got us into a very isolated spot, 10 vehicles full of... Um, Masked up men arrived and just attacked us. Um, we didn't have much chance. And the other one, the hunt was fully chasing a fox. And there were only three of us there, so we dived into the woods with a video camera to try to get, try to get the hounds off the fox and to, and to video it. And they were prepared to kill three people to get that video camera that proved they were breaking the law. But that actually brings me to what I really wanted to talk about, because hunt violence is quite rare. I've, I've had four really bad experiences in 35 years. It's probably safer than going out for a drink on a Saturday night in the town where I live. So it's not that common a thing, but because it is rare, it's the thing that kind of sticks in your mind. But the thing that is really, really absolutely shocking about this is that the police don't do anything. Right? In all of those cases where you've seen that extreme violence against hunt saboteurs, only one of those has ever even come to court and then, despite the fact that one of the perpetrators gave a 20-page statement to the police saying that the other two had done it, they were all acquitted. They walked free from court. And the other ones have never even got near a courtroom. Mostly the police stop the investigations before they go anywhere. So you see our Land Rover being rammed into a ditch by a 15-ton tractor. Apparently he committed no crime. It's incomprehensible. He committed lots of crimes that day. He actually had us unlawfully detained for about an hour and a half. That's kidnapping in English law. And yet the police haven't even investigated that side of it. So there's a lot of... <laughs> You've got to start asking questions why the police behave in the way that they behave. The poor little deer on the left-hand side here was ripped up by a pack of foxhounds. One hunt saboteur was close by and managed to call the others. So the others were rushing towards that deer to try to save its life. Obviously, the first sab, they managed to get the hounds off, but it was very badly injured. Now, several of the other sabs in the group that day were qualified um, veterinarians, worked at animal sanctuaries, could have actually provided some assistance to that deer. As they ran in, the police stopped them, told them they were trespassing, which they weren't, and told them if they didn't leave the land, they would be arrested. Now, normally the police, if they give you that warning, they've got to actually give you time to leave the land. 13 seconds later, they actually arrested them. 13 seconds they were given, because they hadn't complied in 13 seconds, they were arrested. The deer was taken away and shot by the hunt, and the case went to court. It's funny that, case against hunt saboteurs goes to court, 
the judge, a very senior judge, ruled that the police had broken the law themselves, that the hunt saboteurs they described as fine, upstanding citizens who give their time voluntarily to help wildlife. Um, and he slammed the police, but absolutely no action was taken against them. I'm going to have to talk a lot faster than I'm being given time warnings here. Um, reason, this is probably one of the most corrupt police officers in the entire country. This is Officer Crabb, and he was the police officer who arrested the four SABs on that day. He also broke the leg of one of my female friends. Um, she held up one of these spray bottles at a man on a quad bike who was trying to run her over, and they arrested her on firearms charges. And as they put her in the police car, they slammed the door on her leg and broke her leg. Um, and this wildlife crime officer, a person who's meant to investigate hunt crimes, rides with the hunt. Okay, I'll slow down again then. <laughs> I'm probably talking so fast you can't even understand me, especially my strong London accent. I do apologise. Um, this is one of my personal nemeses. This is David Fuller. Um, he's the master, so the probably most important person in the South Down area, Foxhounds. He was a very senior police officer for 30 years, and his wife runs a catering company. Guess who their biggest customer is? Guess why the thugs on the South Down and Erridge never get arrested? I'll say absolutely, I know there's probably a police officer listening in on this. This is total and utter corruption. This guy gets away with what he does because he was a former police officer and his friends in the police protect him and his thugs. What makes me think this? Well, we are heavily infiltrated. We know this. That nasty piece of work on the screen right there. I'll try to blot his name out of my memory. Right, ah uh, yes, this is Bob Lambert. Right, this was an undercover police officer. He was so deep undercover, so convincing. Uh, absolutely the top man. If anything was going down, Bob was the man who was there first. He was the first one to de-lock himself onto the gates of the power station. He was the guy with the money in his pocket. He was the guy who got the van. Everyone looked up to him. Everyone loved Bob. Jackie loved Bob. Jackie had a baby by Bob. Bob turned out to be a police officer. And he's not the only one. The gentleman on the left-hand side there is Lord Pitchford. We now have a, an inquiry, a public inquiry going on in the United Kingdom into undercover policing, into the actions of these undercover officers. We know that something like 12 of these undercover officers had relationships with female activists. They tried to bring a case for rape because they said we wouldn't have slept with them if they'd known when they were police. Um, unfortunately, the response was, well, lots of blokes tell lies to get in girls' knickers, so that's not rape. Yeah, but uh, Jackie in the middle there sued the Metropolitan Police for £400,000 for the trauma that was caused to her. Right. Um, it's not a trial, it's an inquiry. It's a public inquiry. So a judge, a judge will gather lots of evidence. It will take about another two and a half years. So there, there was evidence was submitted this week from lots of different people involved, including a group of hunt saboteurs, um, there was a, a law was brought in that if you, if you go on someone's land in England, right, that's trespass, it's not a crime. Right? The landowner must say, I don't want you on my land, you must leave. Right? But you haven't broken the law. If you still don't go, he can ask the police to come to remove you, but you still haven't broken the law. Unless you're on his land intending to disrupt a lawful activity. Now, they brought this in to stop the miners' strike. Right, so we're, we're striking miners, we're at the collieries trying to stop the, the scabs from getting into the pits. They were trying to stop a lawful activity. Now, having got this law, the police decided to use it against hunt sabs. Uh, so in 1994, a very large group of hunt saboteurs went to a little tiny village in Essex called Good Easter and found themselves met with this massive police presence and 30 sabs were arrested that day, 28 of them for this, under this one particular law. Now, it now turns out that a large number of the people who organized that mass SAB were actually undercover officers. So they literally led that, so those SABs into the trap. The police knew exactly where the SABs were going to be because their own people had set it up. Right? And when I'm training the new hunt saboteurs in my group, the first thing I always say to them is, remember, somebody in this van is not what they say they are. 
Never, ever, ever say that you've been involved in an action. Don't brag about your achievements because somebody in this van is a policeman or is an informer. Uh, so you've got to be so careful. I say these guys were all considered to be the ultimate activists. Right? And they were the ultimate activists because they knew whatever they did, they were getting away with it. This guy admitted carrying out two arson attacks in Germany, two ALF attacks in Germany. Never prosecuted for it. Of course not, he was a copper. Yeah, she won her case. She was given four hundred thousand pounds. So you've got to ask yourself, why would any sane person put themselves through this? Why would anybody be a hunt saboteur? Cubbing season, which is this time of the year, we're getting up at three o'clock in the morning to get out to the countryside areas. The hunts start at first light, six o'clock. We've got a long drive down from London. There's no public transport that time of the morning. I'll literally be out next Saturday morning collecting people from around South London to get them together out in the country. Through the rest of the season, we could be facing some fairly extreme violence. We know that we might get <laughs> battered by the police. We know we might get our houses raided. Uh, People are asleep, stand, awake all night in the badger coal zones. People are standing in the way of people with guns. Why would anybody think of doing it? Well, there's a very simple reason. These are the reasons. Both of these foxes were rescued from the jaws of the hounds and both survived. And there's lots and lots and lots more reasons. Right, these beautiful wild animals that these vile, vile people, they just want to destroy and we want to save. And whatever they do to us, whatever the level of violence, every time I get beaten up by them, it just actually inspires me, spurs me on, just makes me more and more and more determined. I am not going to stop until the last red coat is confined to a history book. It's archaic, it's barbaric and it's got to stop. And no hunter is going to lay down their, their hunting horn or their gizmo or their citronella spray until we've actually put the final nail in the coffins of the hunt. Let's say I'm getting support from a wise variety of different sentients here. It's like barking in the background. It's great. Thank you for hounds. Right. Any questions? I'll just repeat the question. <laughs> Uh, I was wondering about the role of the media, if they actually report about those hunts, if they report that actually the law is being broken by the hunters, and if they take a side or if they don't, and if they do which? The answer to that is it's very, very variable. But I think if there's a trend over the years, it's that the media is becoming far more sympathetic to us. The main problem is actually a lack of reporting. They're actually quite unlikely to report on stories in the actual newspapers, for example. But because there's a, the massive increase in online reporting, anything that makes for good footage, that's online straight away. And the national newspapers pick up those stories in their online versions. So the tractor incident had over a million hits and was reported on, on major news websites to the, to the biggest papers in, in the country reported that one. Um, and that's, that's very different from years gone by where you couldn't get a sab story into the paper. Unless it was one of the times when the hunters had been injured. They, those stories got in very easily. But, but when hunt sabs were injured, that was, that was just really not reported. Unless one actually died. Um, no, it, it, it just didn't, it never got the media attention. My, my friend Steve Christmas was very deliberately run over by the hunt. They didn't actually report that at all until two days later when a demonstration at the kennels turned violent and the kennels was damaged. That was in the paper. And then they printed a little bit of a photograph of Steve in intensive care. But no, the original incident wasn't. So it's, uh, it, it's not something that hits the headlines mostly. When the government tried to repeal the hunting legislation, that made a seven-page spread in one newspaper. They found a former huntsman who told all the stories of hunt cruelty and da da. That that got reported, but no, it's not generally a major issue for the media. Is there another question? Yep. 
Hi, uh, yeah, I was speaking to you earlier. Um, I was wondering about the South Herefordshire hunt. They were basically caught throwing the fox cu cubs into their hounds to train them to kill. I was wondering if they had any charges pressed against them. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, no, there is no prosecution pending. Okay. Which, I um, mean, yeah, it should at least be some kind of animal welfare legislation. I'd have thought it was a clear enough breach of the Hunting Act. For anybody who doesn't know this story, um, around this time of year, uh, th this comes back to what I was saying about the number of hounds that get killed, right? There's 50 hounds in a pack, roughly. And they come into that pack at two years old, and when they're seven, they're considered too old and too slow to hunt, so they just shoot them in the back of the head. And the common practice is then feed the body of the dead hound back to the rest of the pack. I know, they're sick, aren't they? Apparently, this is a quote, one last run in the stomachs of their chums. It's what they would have wanted. Yeah. Right. Now, to replace those hounds they've just killed, they've got to bring some new hounds in. Right. So they, they only need five to replace, but they breed something like 36. So they have six breeding bitches, six, six pups in a litter. And out of those 36, they're only going to use five, so they kill the other 31 mostly at less than a year old. Now, they can't be bothered with spending 10 pence to shoot them, so they just smash their heads on the concrete floor of the kennels. The new hounds they've just brought in, these hounds don't know how to hunt. They've got to be taught how to hunt. So this time of year is their nightmare. This is cubbing season. They've got to get those hounds trained to kill. And the South Hereford hunt had a nice little way of doing that. They captured some fox cubs, and they went into the kennels, and they dropped the live fox cubs into the hounds. And then half an hour later, they brought out what little was left and they put it in a bin. Now, where the, that isn't remarkable. They all do that. They'll all be doing that. What's remarkable is this fantastic group called the Hunt Investigation Team filmed them doing it. So it was all caught on camera, the live cubs being carried in, the dead ones being carried out. But it seems that although their hounds were confiscated at the time, they've just they've been given back to them. Yeah, they've got the, they, haven't yeah. Got, they haven't got all that. They haven't got all the hounds back, but they've been given most of them back. So like I said to you, they'll go back. Yeah, um, they went out on Saturday and the hounds attacked um, three county sabs because they were at the call zone with us and they attacked them. So they've been given some of the hounds back, but not all of them. We don't know what's happened to the rest of the hounds. Uh, you know, it's just staggering. You, you couldn't get clearer evidence of illegal behaviour and yet the police don't seem to be doing anything. So, yet again, it's going to be down to the sabs. If they attacked three sabs last weekend... I couldn't take a fair guess what's going to happen next weekend. <laughs> we'll, be there. we'll be there. We'll be there as well. I'll bring, I'll bring the South East with me. Yeah. Yes, gentlemen, right up the back there. Where? Yeah. I'm Oculus, is my name. Uh, I have a question. I'm never talking publicly. I have... I'm from Luxembourg. I'm, uh, I think, the number one enemy for some 20 years of all hunters, at least in this tiny country, but certainly beyond borders, because hunters don't know borders, as we know. Animals don't know borders either. Uh, I have, um, we also talked before, maybe before, said I have a somewhat perhaps difficult, tricky question just came to my mind, but it has been bothering me personally for years. Is it uh, morally justifiable to kill a hunter? It's, um, it's a moral dilemma. I'm aware of that. On the one hand, people like myself and you and all in this room, I guess, don't want to kill any sentient, sentient living being. On the other hand, by killing a hunter, you uh, save many lives, numerous lives. It's an almost classical moral dilemma. And I ask uh, myself uh, this question very often. I don't know if you or others in this room who may... Uh, want to react to this, think of this, uh, of this question, because it's also important in a very general ethical sense, beyond the pure humans-animal relationship. Sorry, I don't want to be too long, but yeah. 
I'm just okay. going to so try. So is it morally justifiable to kill a hunter? Yeah, I'm just going to try to find you a photograph that actually answers that question. There, right, just coming up. Bear with me a moment. Right, okay. This photograph should answer your question. It's actually a little video clip. This is a hunter who's fallen from his horse. He's actually broken his back in two places. The person treating him is a hunt saboteur who's also a paramedic. No, it's not morally right to kill them, whatever they do. We are there. Almost every hunt sub I know is an ethical vegan. We love life. We're going to protect the life of any sentient being. Right? That guy, would, when he, initially he fell, the, the sabs were near him. They saw he'd fallen. They offered help. They said, we have a trained paramedic on our van. He said, I'd rather die. After a few minutes, he changed his mind and he realized how much pain he was in. That paramedic ran fully 800 meters across a plowed field carrying a first aid kit to get to him. So. We're there to protect and preserve all life. Every life is, pre is precious. You've got to kind of hope that by showing that humanity, you start to turn them around a bit. Is there another question? Um, <laughs> He didn't, but then again, he left in an emergency out of the ambulance, eventually got to him. Um, I, was, I took over driving the vehicle because the, the paramedic had been driving. We were trying to actually mark the entrance to the farm so the ambulance would find it easily. And the other hunters blocked our vehicle to stop us moving, even though we told them what we were doing. Um, there was a bit of an argument after that, and one of the other hunters came over and calmed the argument down. He, he was very apologetic for the ones that had blocked us, and he thanked us not just that week, but the following week. So, yeah, I think they, some of them were grateful. Some of them weren't, because five days later they came around to my house and slashed the tires of our Land Rover. <laughs> I've heard that in the UK you can bring, bring criminal prosecutions privately, like the RSPCA is doing in some animal cruelty cases. Why don't you bring criminal prosecutions against violent hunt thugs? Uh, it's extremely expensive. The, the amount of money to bring a private prosecution. The reason the RSPCA are no longer bringing prosecutions against people caught hunting illegally is the last case cost that organisation a third of a million pounds. The hunters were convicted, but the judge didn't award the cost against the hunt. So the RSPCA ended up paying the full cost of bringing that prosecution. And the RSPCA supporters said, that isn't what we're giving our money for. We want you to go and rescue stray cats and dogs. And the chairman had to resign for having done it. Um, the HSA, we run on a shoestring budget. That would be about 10 to 15 years worth of our budget to bring a private prosecution. We can't do it. We don't have that level of funds. So unfortunately, when we do get good evidence, all we can do is pass it to other organizations because we can't bring those prosecutions. And by and large, the police won't do it. Um, hi, how would you go about ha setting up a hunt saboteurs group in a country that doesn't have one? And how many people would you say you need in a group to successfully hunt sab? Thank you for asking that. That is actually my specialist role within the organization. Um, again, great big hand for our Belgian colleagues up the back there, one of our most successful groups we've ever worked with. I think it's only about 18 months ago that I had the, held the first meeting with them. We sat down in a nice little vegan cafe in uh, Hent. We had a good discussion about next stages. Um, they use Facebook to try to increase the size of their group, the number of people. Um, they started doing some research. This is the absolutely crucial thing. You've got to find out everything you can about the laws in your country, what laws might help you, what laws might hinder you. France, for example, is a 10,000 euro fine if you get caught sabotaging a hunt. Um, America, it's even worse. It's actually illegal in all 52 states to sabotage a hunt. Um, so you, you kind of got, you got to know your legal background. Even if it's illegal to sab a hunt, that's not necessarily going to stop you because if you're 
50 kilometers out into the countryside, how many police officers are there? How long is it going to take them to get enough police officers to deal with you? We get this when we're doing the shoots. We know we're breaking the law, but to get enough police there to actually deal with 30 hunt sabs, that's going to take them a long time. They've got to pull them off other duties in town centres to get them out there. Um, it's difficult for them, so it takes them a couple of hours, and all that time, you know, we're, we're in a good position. So just say, find out your laws. Um, I've just been out to Slovenia recently. Great group out there, really solid group already out there. And I read their hunting act. They gave me a copy of the hunting act. Now, it's, I'm looking through that, and straight away, I can see their hunters almost certainly are not sticking within the law. So I've left them doing more research, trying to prove that their hunts are acting illegally. Right? It's always best if you can have the law on your side. Yeah, it gives you a much stronger position. Um, I'm sure this is, uh, this is definitely true in the UK, and it's probably true everywhere else. The police are flaming thick. Right? They are not intelligent people. Sorry to the ones sitting in here. I didn't mean to insult you. There are bound to be some around. <laughs> there always are. Yeah. But they, are, they really are dumb. They do not know the law. Now, if you know the law, when you get in those situations where you're interacting with the police and you're spelling out to them what the law is and you say, I'm quiet, don't get angry with the police. Yeah, this, I have problems with my group all the time. It's like, don't shout at the nice policeman, talk to him. Uh, if you're really clear what the law is and you're spelling out the legislation to the police officer, it, it kind of knocks the, it knocks the wind out of their sails a bit. They think, oh, someone actually knows what they're talking about here. And they're going to be more willing to cooperate with you. Whereas if you're just going, Spring of cover up bloody eight covers, da, 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 da. you know, they're not, that's not going to provoke a good response from them. Whereas if you go, actually, you can't arrest me on a section 68 because they're kind of, oh, oh, this bloke actually knows his law, does he? And they're, they're, section 68, by the way, is the thing about trespassing with intent to stop a lawful activity. We had a test case recently, four Hunt Sabs were arrested on this. Um, they were acquitted because. In order for the police to arrest you on that particular law, they've got to be able to prove that the activity you're stopping is lawful. Now, because the police aren't policing the hunt, they're never very close to the hunt, they can never prove that it is lawful. So as soon as I arrive at hunt, if I see a police officer at hunt, I say, they're hunting illegally, they're hunting illegally, they're hunting illegally. All this on video, of course. If later in the day I get arrested for Section 68, I go, but it wasn't lawful. And, and, you know, I know I'm getting out of the cells quick. So finding your legislation, it's going to be individual in each country. It depends where you're operating. It will be different. Find out what the police response is going to be like. Find out what your hunters are like. You know, we've got this impression. These are men who like killing things. They're really violent, aren't they? Despite what I've shown you today, no, most of them aren't, actually. There's usually a minority that are trouble, and most of the rest of them are actually won't get involved at all. They'll stand and watch, but they won't get stuck in. Build your group up. How many do you need? Well, how are you going to sabotage the hunt? We're lucky. We can get groups of 40, 50 hunt saboteurs together. We can get right in their faces, right under their noses. And we've got a lot of legislation that helps us. But we've sabotaged hunts with two people. Now, if you've got two of you, you're not actually going to see them. You'll never actually come in contact with your hunt. You're going to be ahead of them all day long, driving the animals out of their path. We call it pre-beating. Right? I've known one person destroy a hunt. She saw some people shooting. Pretty girl, streaming in tears. I've lost my little dog. He's running into the woods. Please don't shoot. You'll kill my little dog. All the hunters stopped to look for the dog. Two hours <laughs> of no killing. One person. Yeah? It doesn't have to be the way we do it. Yeah? <laughs> so there's... You've got to remember, it's not all about the, the kind of big thing that you see that I've shown here. What your tactics are going to be are going to vary from place to place. So when you're setting up your group, think about people with skills. Think about people who are going to think about things. Think about having a driver. Thinking about having someone who's good on computers. The internet is a massive boon to our organization. If you've got someone who's sensible on Facebook and doesn't put up stupid things and only drives traffic into your group, that's how you grow your group. And then when you've got your information, if just about everywhere we go, we find hunters breaking the law. Start gathering that evidence. Right? Start finding out what they're doing that they're not allowed to be doing. Some of the covert surveillance equipment that's available these days is absolutely fantastic. The hidden cameras, 
movement sensitive triggered cameras you can put them in all sorts of places no one would ever know they were there that's how the the um pitchley video was obtained it's how the south hereford video is obtained we, we can there's great technology we just need to box more clever right and catch them time and time and time again breaking the law once you've got your group together see how many people you've got and what skills you've got and then you adapt your tactics to a, the type of hunting you're dealing with, and B, to the people that you've got and, and how they want to handle it. And certainly in the UK, most of the groups are anarchist groups, so there, there isn't a leadership structure. It's not like anyone's going to tell you, go and stand over there and do this. People have to work out for themselves what their strengths are and, and utilise those strengths within the group. Um, there's one thing I um, feel the need to clarify. Um, when you're talking about setting up hunting sand sabotage groups, um, we should be aware that in Europe, maybe apart from Ireland and France, hunting in that sense that you are sabotaging doesn't even exist, does it? I mean, chasing animals with red coats and um, dogs doesn't happen. So the, it, it just is a completely different kind of style without gizmos and without, um, without any seed or whatever. You, you can't... Um, the, the sabbing is a very different matter. There's also shoots with pheasants or releasing birds. There's driven shoots for hares. And there's all very different aspects in there. This is what I meant about you have to adapt your sabbing to the group you've got and the type of hunting you're dealing with. So one of the things I did with the Belgian sabs is once they'd identified the hunting grounds, I actually went out to Belgium and we walked through the hunting grounds together. And I put my 35 years of experience into that and went, okay, if I had to do this particular type of shoot, this is what I would be doing. Right, so I've just, I just left that idea with them. I think some of the ideas I put in place are actually things that they've actioned. But I, I can cast my eye over that hunting ground and, and know roughly what's going to be happening there, even if it's a type of hunting I don't normally do myself. And I will cheerfully go absolutely anywhere that anyone will invite me. If you get a hunt tab group together, I'll come and walk your hunting grounds with you. I'll come and give you advice that's tailored specifically to where you're working and the kind of hunting you're dealing with. Right? Driven hunts, we, you know, we, we deal with pheasant shoots. What have they got to do? They've got to drive the pheasants towards the guns. What are we going to do? We're going to drive them the other way. We're going to make sure there isn't a pheasant within a 30 mile radius on the day they're actually having their hunt. The police can be very helpful on this one. The last time we did a big shoot, they brought a helicopter. That stopped them shooting and cleared every pheasant out from a very, very wide distance. So sometimes the police are helpful and friendly. Is there another question? Comment, something, anything? Hi, uh, I was just wondering, why do you wear masks? Well, with our hunt saps, we don't really wear them. We think it's easier to participate with people in their surroundings. Otherwise, like you said, you look like aggressive people or terrorists. Um, Personally, I very, very rarely wear a face mask anymore. Unfortunately, almost all of the hunters on the hunts I do regularly know who I am, even if I am masked up. I've only got to start calling the hounds and they know who I am. They, they speak to me by name and I talk to them by name. You know, I've known some of these people over 30 years. I wouldn't call them friends, but I've known them a long time. So the, for, <laughs> for me, most of the time, it, the, the, the mask is actually it's futile. Um, the reason that some people do it, some people are worried about being identified. Especially if you actually live in rural areas, um, you might not want hunters who live in the same village as you knowing that you're out sabotaging their hunt. So people do conceal their identities. Some people are worried about if they're found to be a hunt sab, they might cause problems at work. Um, we're really, really lucky in the UK. There was a big test case where a man who was a good friend of mine, actually called Joe, was fired because he was a hunt saboteur and his bosses were hunters. He took them to court. He won. And now being a hunt saboteur and ethical vegan are protected characteristics in the workplace, so they can't discriminate against you any more than they can discriminate on grounds of gender or sexual orientation. So we've got that same legal protection now. Everyone where I work knows exactly what I do. I, I don't make any... I'm, I'm proud of what I am. Yeah. So I, I don't feel the need to conceal my identity anymore, but obviously other people have got different issues and, and might not want to be... I think when I was going through my divorce, for example, I was a lot more tetchy about being identified as a sab in case my ex-wife found and tried to use it in court. You know, but 
but you know, each people, each, it's, again, it's an anarchic organization, lack of organization. So people do what they want to do on that one. Short follow-on question, if you allow. I, um, I noticed in this room, there are not uh, really radicals, but I'm the only, I'm much older, twice, three times older than anybody else in this room, but much, three times more radical probably too. So, um, I received in the last 15, 20 years a number of death threats from, from hunters or the Hunter Federation, from members of the Hunter Federation. So it's uh, not always easy. But on the other hand, I heard your response, I heard the applause, uh, one is not allowed to do major harm. I used the word killing, it was provoking a bit, provocative somewhat. But um, the question then is, where does the buck stop? Where's the limit? What, uh, how far can one go in in, um, since for me and many in this room, hunters are terrorists, how far can one go in counter-terrorism? Uh, what kind of violence against the violent, the, the perverts, because all hunters are sexual perverts, as I call them, and that's perhaps one of the reasons they hate me, and they know this, they are, because I talk to a number of of former hunters, people who know. And there's also the book I recommend by a former hunter philosopher, Parin, excellent book, who describes this. It's all about sexual lust, killing animals, and what comes after the killing. So how far can one go? That's, in fact, my question. I want to hear from somebody who is engaged in daily action against Hunting, and perhaps I hear you, you are coming uh, to help organize sabotage in Belgium. We live in Belgium for the moment, so perhaps I come back to you about this because I'm not very good at that, <laughs> personally. It's, it's a simple answer. If I'm attacked by the hunters, I will defend myself within the law, which is a really complicated thing in the United Kingdom because you're allowed to use reasonable force but there's no legal definition of the word reasonable. So it has to be proportionate to the threat. In other words, if a man is coming at you, and I have had this situation, with a huge knife, and you have no escape route, then you're actually legally allowed to kill him if it's the only way you can stop him killing you. Luckily for me, when I had the man coming at me with the huge knife, I managed to get in my Land Rover and get the hell out, so I didn't have to take that option, but I would have been allowed to. Um, I would never contemplate using excessive violence, right? So if a hunter was down, I wouldn't think about putting the boot in because we're not there to harm, we're there to save. But again, it's a, it's a as I keep saying, hunt sabotage, There is, it's very anarchic. Everyone's got to make their own decisions. People have got to think about what they're doing. So other people might draw the line a different place to I do, where I do. Now that's no criticism of them, that's them using their brains and taking their own decisions, they're making their own choices. But as a general rule, you know, hunt saboteurs are non-violent direct action. We do not go out to seek confrontation. We go out to save lives. But we will defend ourselves to the best of our abilities if we're under attack. So I think we do have time for one last question, if there is another question. I live in Leicestershire in England, which has got, I think, three or four hunts. Uh, it's a very big hunting county. And county council and councils own a lot of land. Have you put pressure on the councils in other parts of the country to stop hunting on their land? I will point out at this stage as well that I am a councillor. And I, after hearing your talk, will be now asking questions about the hunts going on land which our council owns, and be doing my damnedest to put in a motion to stop it. Great. All I said, when I lived in Shropshire, 
um, Shropshire County Council had banned hunting on all of its land and the council owns masses of land, most of it which is rented out to tenant farmers and hunting was banned on all council owned land including the rented out stuff. So, I mean, that when, in the days when I was living in North Shropshire, there wasn't a North Shropshire hunt because they just had no territory. So, yes, councils are, you know, it's really important. Where we've been focusing a lot of attention recently is not on the councils but on the National Trust because the National Trust is one of Britain's biggest landowners and it allows blatantly illegal hunting on its land. And even when presented with evidence of that, there was one particular car, it was the Mayanal hunt, um, they banned them for one year after they were filmed absolutely banged to rights illegally hunting. So it's a lot of effort, it's a lot of work, and as I said before, the HSA is actually quite a small organisation We're literally just 12 unpaid volunteers running it. Um, it might be something that one of the bigger groups that have got paid staff like um, LAX might be willing, that's the League Against Cruel Sports, sorry, um, they might be willing to take on that sort of campaign. I don't think it's something we could do. Um, there is, of course, the online petition these days. People can raise petitions online, and those, those things have to be debated by governments. Um, if enough signatures are raised, that might be a route forward. I can certainly ask the social media office on that. Yeah, but anything, again, you know, if you think of setting up groups in other countries, anything that anyone can do, it doesn't actually have to be getting out and getting in the way of the hunters. There's lots of clever ideas like that that can seriously disadvantage them. Okay. So thank you for your very interesting talk, Alfie. It was great.